In his typically penetrating and yet provocative way, Schillinger begins his chapter on canonic imitation by reminding us that nature provides the original model for imitative music, that the ancient Greeks named a god after the phenomenon, and that contemporary music theorists have yet revealed their narrow-minded ignorance. Schillinger only deals with counterpoint in two parts. The existence of notes for counterpoint in more than two parts is unclear. He approaches the subject as a physicist. A two-part canon is a melody folded over on itself, coexisting in two or more different parts in different phases. Three main considerations affecting the relationship of the two voices are identified. The intonation of the scale, mode or transposition of one voice relative to the other. The melodic trajectory, the axes and the rhythmic structure. The chapter beginning on page 777 deals with the last of these matters. Any rhythm can become the source for a canon by developing it into a symmetrical form. In this example, the non-symmetrical rhythmic pattern is 1, 2, 3, and it's developed into a symmetry. The pattern is then further developed by a sequence of such symmetries based on rotations of the original motive. The imitation in a second voice is the repetition of the original pattern at a time delay equal to the duration of the original motive. Endings have to be manufactured because the canon has a tendency to continue indefinitely unless it's stopped. This involves liquidating the features of the original motif and emphasising the primary axis in both parts in order to produce a pitch cadence. Here's a more complex example from a composition of my own. You'll notice how elements of Schillinger's method have been modified and adapted into a real-life situation. The music was part of a score commissioned for a dance company and had to be upbeat and humorous. I used a canon to build and intensify the dance before a sudden and dramatic change in the story. I took the type 1 rhythm 8 to 3 and extended it using permutations. An increase in intensity is brought about by use of subdivision. For the first six bars, the unit 1 equals a quaver. Thereafter, the unit becomes a semiquaver. The imitation doesn't enter at the expected point, halfway through the first statement of the theme, and so this is an example of a displaced imitation. The canon comes to an end as both parts hold an extended duration. In the score, this coincides with the beginning of a crossfade into the new section. 